Okay, fine. So we have uh, today uh, with uh, it's our display interview method, and uh, we have the previously seen two methods of data collection. Uh, one was uh, like collecting information through correspondence, and another was an observation method. But today we will look into the interview method. There are different types of interview method with the help of which primary data can be collected. Out of which the first method is direct personal interview method. In a direct personal interview method, the person who wants the information, uh, that is uh, the investigator, and the person whom, from whom the information is to be collected, that is the respondent, they come face to face and there is exchange of information between them. This is an example of direct, uh, direct personal interview. Here they actually see each other, they have eye contact, they shake hands or be in touch with each other physically. And this is a very common way of extracting the information. This information collection process may be supported by a uh, sheet of paper or a list of questions that are to be asked or it may be a informal type of discussion. Obviously, the purpose of the discussion is to get information about a particular aspect or related to a particular matter. Uh, you must have seen that uh, when you, you go for job interviews, you will find that there are few people asking the questions and you are the only person who is giving the answer. So, here the number of, uh, this is actually a particular type of direct personal interview where the people who are asking the questions are more and the person who is giving the response is single. This is, is in fact the situation very ironic. That means uh, you are kept alone and the other party, uh, they are in large number there compared to what you are. Anyway, so this is also a part, part type of direct personal interview. In addition to that, in, you must have been, uh, seen in television different types of interview where there is generally one interviewer and there sometimes there are multiple number of responses. That means uh, often you open the uh, television, now also it will be, there will be a whole discussion in different channels, uh, the elections in some of the Indian states are in the office. So you will find that uh, discussion taking place where there is one person asking the question and that there are several people who are giving the answer. So reverse of what we see in a job interview. This is just the reverse. Uh, sometimes a single person is taking interview from one person or a single person is also taking interview from a group of people. So these are different variations of direct personal interview. In direct personal interview, the advantage is that uh, there is eye contact between the persons uh, who is giving the information, who is taking the information. And so uh, there are many things told between the uh, lines which can be understood in a direct personal interview. That means if you, you uh, can understand by giving a per response whether a person is confused, whether the person might be possibly he is telling a lie, Possibly you can ask some other corroboratory questions, corroborative questions and supporting questions to understand what information he has given is true or partially true or uh, not true at all. So these are some advantages of direct personal interview. Disadvantage is that you may have to undergo a lot of traveling. It is quite time to It will take a lot of time for you to collect the information from this. So that is one uh, disadvantage of direct personal interview. Well, it will be expensive also. And uh, if the sample size or the number of respondents are large in number, then direct personal interview might not be a successful one. Uh, but uh, here in this case of direct personal interview, the thing is that the prime uh, individual is interviewed. For example, in a job interview, my uh, point is to know what is your knowledge about the subject, how my, will, whether you will be able to do the job. So I interview you only, that is direct personal interview. Uh, for example, in universities earlier, there was a, uh, there was a, uh, while choosing the vice chancellor, there was a system called a search committee. That means, for example, a particular university's vice chancellor has to be appointed. So the government makes a search committee which generally comprises of senior academicians, senior than the vice chancellor. And now they go into the field, ask different people uh, in and around and try to find out a shortlist a group of people who might be suitable for the post of the vice chancellor. 
Now that particular individual might be interviewed, he might not be interviewed also. So that is actually an indirect personal interview. That means you are collecting information from someone, but through, through a third person. So that is called indirect personal interview. But in direct personal interview, that the person concerned is directly in contact with the group who is interviewing him. For example, nowadays, that old uh, practice is stopped. Nowadays, what um, uh, choosing a vice chancellor or appointing a vice chancellor advertisement comes in the newspaper or in different other uh, social platforms. So, people interested with having sufficient qualification, they apply for the post. And then, just like any other job, the interview is conducted. Obviously, shortlisting is done, etc., etc., but like any other job, the interview is conducted. So, that is a direct personal interview. Indirect personal interview is quite popular when you want to collect information about some sensitive matter to which you are sure that the group might not be able to respond. For example, suppose, let us take an example, suppose there was a uh, commotion between the police and the public. The public was showing some demonstration near a say, government office and then uh, the, suddenly the police came and the police uh, fired uh, rubber bullets or charged the people with, lat with lati. The lati charge is now an English word. Uh, it is available in uh, Indian edition of the um, Oxford Dictionary, Indian edition, lati charge, to beat up with sticks, meaning is written there, to beat up with sticks. So, uh, so lati charge, they are charged with lati, so uh, these policemen, uh, they were, they were, and now after, after the, after the incident has taken place, some, Security that means not death actually, but some people were injured. Um, they were beaten very badly by the police, they were injured. Now, it is once again the responsibility of the police itself to take the people to the hospital and see that these people are given proper treatment. It's a very ironic situation. There should have been another group which actually should try to save the people and take them to the hospital. But the same people, same policemen who have beaten them up uh, five minutes early and now are responsible to take them to the hospital. So, anyways, so they are taken to the hospital, now the reporter comes and wants to know what actually happened. Now, if there are this situation, in this situation actually you will get two different opinions. If you ask the police that what actually happened in the incident, please let me know. This police will tell you a story that uh, these uh, public were very much uh, disturbing, they were trying to attack, they were trying to damage public property, and they were beating up innocent people uh, who were actually um, standing in the side of the road or going out from the office, and uh, there was no other option for them but to control the, uh, control the public, they were to uh, fire rubber bullets or, or, or they, they were to um, charge them with luck. So this is uh, this is the situation happening there. Now what happens uh, if the reverse happens? If the reverse happens, if you go to the public who are in the hospital and now actually are under treatment, if you go and ask them or some people who might be injured uh, or who was present there, uh, one of the foremost uh, um, foremost uh, public who participated in the commotion. You will ask them, they will tell that no, sir, we see we are in, in, in a very humble protest and we were uh, non-violently, we are just uh, raising some slogans against the authorities because they had uh, done many things or were not doing duty properly, whatever. Uh, so we were uh, just uh, throwing some slogans, uh, just uh, the, uh, means, uh, but suddenly the police came from our behind and they started to charge up with Latin and some people came from the front also, and so we had no other way to go. So this was uh, not done. So when you take the interview, you will find that the situation is quite confusing. Both of them are saying their own story. This many a times happens in different types of departmental investigation, where there is a complaint between the one people uh, complain against the other. Now we listen to both of them, and both of them might even, they might have some live evidence also. Uh, that this was, you see, this was what happened, this is how we were shouting slogans, uh, just shouting slogans, and we, see, here police is coming from the uh, other side and trying to do that. And in the police, they also have some videos, that you really see, they are uh, throwing stones at us. And you see that uh, car, if they are throwing stones, or if they were so non-violent, how did the two vehicles, government vehicles, burn there? Who burned it? Now, will you tell that the police has burned it? So they will mean you will get quite confused because both the sides will have equal type of evidence or equal type of 
limitations against each other. Uh, and generally, it happens in uh, different organizations. It is compulsory you have to have internal complaint committee, where there is a harassment uh, of uh, uh, particular gender against the other by the other. And uh, these cases are actually reported in ICC. Now, when the ICC sessions goes on, uh, when the both the parties are uh, summoned uh, one after the other and their opinion are recorded, it will be found that uh, they actually give. Uh, Different types of viewpoints, uh, and they are both very contradicting and both very confusing. So, person taking the decision for him or her sometimes it becomes difficult to understand which side. In such cases, indirect personal interview uh, can become very practical. Indirect personal interview actually interview is taken from third party, and it should be assured that that third party is not no way related to the first party or the second party. And uh, they will provide you information about what is happening. For example, in such incident where there was a fight between the police and the public, you will find that some people were sending the car away and they were watching whatever is happening. Sometimes it happens that you hear that a particular place there were some uh, huge buildings, and uh, from those buildings, uh, these sort of postal buildings, people are standing looking and uh, the incident. Or you might find that there are some uh, tyvala. Who was actually selling tea, taking an advantage of the crowd and telling, uh, selling some tea. He might know what is the situation, what uh, way it has. Or some panwala. So who might be having a pan shop nearby and uh, from his shop he was watching everything. So similarly, such information are provided by third party. Many a case, uh, this uh, another important uh, is the barber uh, person. Barber actually he actually uh, collects lot of information from what is happening around. Uh, in addition to that, he also enters into the private life of many people. Like when people who cut their uh, beard or say, means, uh, shave their beard or cut their hair in the barber shop, the barber also starts asking many questions. Such as uh, that day I wish so you were I mean, so nicely dressed and going to some waiting for uh, going in a car. Where did you go? Then you say, okay, I went to marriage. Then okay, okay, uh, yeah, then. A few days ago, I also saw you taking a bag and doing something early in the morning. No, oh, I went to the airport. Why was sleeping? Why? So tell I went to Pune. So he collects all this type of information. So sometimes these type of uh, people have lot of information, and uh, they are actually uh, this is a process of indirect personal interview of collecting information. So once you go back to the uh, the person investigating, once he goes back to the um, barber, the barber might provide him with some. Such information. So this is called as indirect personal interview. Already I have uh, circulated a note. Its uh, title of the note is the date with data. There all these things are present there. You are requested to go through it by this. Uh, also I take the opportunity to tell you that very few views of the videos that I am uploading. Uh, this is I am uploading in YouTube and giving a link in your uh, uh, classroom, Google classroom. But views are two or three only. So, if there are 24 students, at least there should be 24 views, at least minimum 24 views. Uh, so, but it is two or three, that means uh, most of the, uh, out of the two, three, one is my view. <laughs> so, you have to deduct that number. So, if there are three views, that means only two people have seen the video. So, okay, this is, so please uh, watch the video and don't keep things uh, piled up for the last moment. Okay, now coming to structured interview. In a structured interview, we have a particular list of questions uh, which might be in the form of questions or might be in the form of points which are dotted down by the interviewer and these points are actually asked to and the respondent uh, one by one so that this information are noted down uh, or the, uh, all, the, all the questions in this field are asked to the respondent. Uh, this is called as a structured interview. Uh, it um, might not be uh, written always by the, but the points are written. There is a structure, way and flow of the uh, interview, uh, which is not possible in a direct or a indirect personal interview. Internet, indirect and direct personal interview, depending on the flow of the question, the next question might change. So that is one way, because that is a little bit informal way of taking information. Structured interview are more or less a more formal way of collecting information. For example, in FM there is a channel, very old channel of India, uh, radio station, Vivid Bharati. 
and i think many of you actually heard about the channel is what uh, regular listener of the channel and they give uh, means they will play all old songs and lot of stories about uh, films and in between they give news also but uh, the focus is on mainly on music different types of music sometimes indian classical music etc now these are called as in that uh, there is a program on that particular radio station there is a program which is called as celluloid ke sitare celluloid ke sitare celluloid means film film star so some film stars are invited not basically all are actors some one may be music director some one may be lyricist etc etc uh, but the questions are remain the same i have uh, not the question remains the same that which was uh, your past movie I can you recall a, a song from your past movie and they will actually play the song after that so uh, then uh, uh, this is a when uh, you have acted in many films with certain such actor uh, so can you what are your favorite movies to when uh, the shooting is against that particular actor or actor so they tell something and they, this time the question set is almost same so the question set hardly changes and it is a such a set of question that it fits almost every celluloid ke sitar it is very interesting the question set uh, i think they interview it uh, separately and later on they punch uh, the questions and the answers that way and some play in some songs in between so that is an interesting way maybe in this uh, actually saves a lot of expenditure so that is a celluloid ke sitar that is an example of structured interview similar type of question same format asked to different people structured interview unstructured interview here actually in case of unstructured interview the respondent is put to a situation and the respondent is asked to respond to the situation now when the respondent actually uh, responds to this situation uh, the answer of uh, becomes uh, available um we are taking an example i have an example but that's a big one i am discussing about this for example there is Two days ago, I used an unstructured interview to collect information from some people. It was about workplace readiness. I was reading about a very interesting thing. Its problem is related to uh, related to HR. So those who are interested in HR may find out uh, this is very interesting. When you do project, you can do the a project on that issue. Workplace readiness. Workplace readiness. I was reading about the math, and the study was about workplace readiness. What is that? it is said that when nurses that take training they take training measuring blood pressure taking injection taking blood for blood test etc etc then suppose some patient uh, is they are going to see how to inform the doctor in case doctor is delayed then what to do how to give some emergency medical um, measures or actually how to deal with the many manage help in the hospital in management and uh, so many things they learn they are they learn statistics also i had uh, taught some nurses statistics uh, anyway so uh, they learn statistics also anyway so when they are in the field actually when they are uh, already joined the job in a hospital at the very start thing they need to be very workplace ready so if you tell that no no i cannot take blood from the patient's body or i cannot uh, give the patient work that electric shock or suppose a patient uh, suddenly dies he is not in of the age of dying uh, untimely death and then how to convince or how to talk or how to console uh, the members family members uh, about the person uh, not being there so these type of things is the last thing that no i i i am a little bit scared or i am not in a position to take up some of these activities and obviously she is not workplace ready so this workplace readiness now if you interview some new worker suppose you go and interview some new worker and that okay are you workplace ready do you know all things required for your job most of them will tell that yeah yeah we are workplace ready we are very ready we had had training and we had live sessions also we have done uh, once, uh, um, i i was an apprentice in such and such during the course i went for a summer training or uh, uh, internship also i went so they will tell you many reasons why they are why they believe that they are workplace Um, but uh, in that case was what happened uh, so i was actually measuring workplace readiness nurses is the article that i read and then i got interested and then i was measuring workplace readiness of some teacher the teaching job is like that that most of the teachers uh, don't have formal education in teaching especially uh, school teachers they had 
most uh, these days when we uh, compulsorily they have to go through bed the ed is actually on teaching technology and then uh, also there is some practical but in university job or in college job there is no formal training on teaching and the interview board also just looks at uh, their credentials or uh, means their uh, marks and all uh, and mostly a point some uh, interview boards ask the candidate to do some teaching so that they can understand the classroom situation how the teacher will react Uh, but other than that, there is no formal training. Now the people join based based on their um, result in the different examinations, and then they are in the class. Now in the class, they will actually face different types of situations. First, the young teacher, the students also in many cases it so happens that especially in higher education, the students are almost of the same age as that of the teacher at the beginning, at the beginning of their career. Then they does not they are I mean, they don't like to listen to the teacher because. Uh, they think that the teacher is of our age. What to listen to this particular person? So let us try to uh, play some mischief in the class. Let us try to put the teacher into some trouble. Let us ask some questions so that the teacher gets worried. So this type of situation is happening. And now, if the teacher is workplace ready, uh, then the teacher can handle the situation. Otherwise, so I was studying about that. But when we started the uh, survey, we found that. It's no point of taking the survey to individuals because the, here the individuals are very much alike. If something interesting happened, you know, no, no, in the past class I was very strict. All the students were very scared of me. I told them that you remain clean, drop silence in the class. And then the very beginning I turned two students out of the class because they were talking, and that made them my day. And then all the students remain silent. Listen to me. This is also not workplace ready, but anyway, these stories are told in such a way that nothing, no trouble was there. So ultimately, you are not getting the opinion of the individual. So what was done is that I made a small movie with some actors on workplace readiness. That means the teacher is going for first time in the class, and then she is starting from one city going to another city where she knows no one. Earlier only she came to the city to appear for an interview, and then even the departmental people also she doesn't know. So she puts up in a uh, guest house near the college, then this is the head of the department. And head of the department uh, shows her uh, class that you go and teach, uh, and these the students of this class did not introduce uh, her also to the class. And uh, when she went, she did not take many books also. And the very second day, she was asked to teach the class, and then day of her joining, so she was a uh, little bit trembling. And then uh, based on this story, and then we take took the responses from the people. That uh, name of the character was Jennifer in that story. It was that Jennifer was uh, what uh, happened to Jennifer. Jennifer should have to, uh, took uh, her book with the uh, uh, while she was traveling. So many books she should have taken. She would have asked for few days before preparation. Uh, it, it was unjustified to put her to a situation like this. So so many statements were there, and people were to be at it. And uh, some of the videos I have uploaded regarding scaling techniques, uh, which were applied actually, which most of you have not viewed. So uh, I hope that uh, days to come you will view and then you can relate this uh, incident to this. So this way we collected the information. Now when the information was collected through a scale, giving a story in, in the backdrop or a video in the backdrop. Now people are not thinking that this is our opinion uh, about our own life, but this is our opinion about Jennifer. And so now what the felt were started to come out. Earlier what they felt they did not spell out. They were spelling something else. So that they seem to be very bold and dynamic and look very smart, but now they are reacting on a third person, that is Jennifer, and that was what was done, and uh, that what made the study and the results interesting. So this is called as an unstructured interview, where you take the information from the respondent in disguise. The respondent is not aware of the situation that some interview, uh, some interview or information is taken from his or her. Okay, now I can invite some questions. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Um, so, in case of this uh, entire personal interview, yes. that point, good point, you have written uh, in a bracket, high K, pan, something uh -huh. like that. Uh -huh. What is the refer to the data collection from third party uh, like that? Yeah, yeah, it is actually means suppose the situation is going on. Uh, maybe a commotion between the police and the public, and then uh, if you go to police, they will say, uh, tell he one side of the story, and if you go to the public, they will give another side of the story, and both will be confusing and uh, contradictory. 
In that case, you can ask some people who were nearby but not associated with the police or the public, like uh, Panwala, like barber shop, like cycle mechanic, like Chaiwala who might have been uh, selling chai to these uh, people. But you have to be sure that uh, this third party, who you are thinking to the to to be the third party, is neither in support of the first party or with the second party. So they should not be supporters. Neither they are. Uh, people of first party or second party, right? rather they should be pure third party. So that's what I was saying. Basically, basically neutral, neutral. Basically neutral. Basically neutral. Okay. Okay, sir. So that is the thing. Okay, any other question? Okay, then we go to telephonic interview. Telephonic interviews is another interesting aspect. In telephonic interviews, what is happening that the person is calling you over telephone. And it taking information from you about uh, some uh, survey topic or some research topic. Definitely, you must have experienced this. That in the most busiest hour of your of the day, suddenly there a call comes to you. So somehow you manage to pick up the call, and then the person is telling that okay, I am calling from Axis Bank. You are um, so can be uh, given a pre-approved loan of five lakh rupees. Are you interested? And then these type of things happen actually, uh, and uh, these phone calls come at very odd hours of the day. Now some of such phone calls might be also to conduct a survey. Now here two things are very interesting, which is not happening with other type of interviews. Here you see, you don't know what are the questions that will be asked. Okay, what are the questions? In some other surveys, you say you see that like a questionnaire, questionnaire survey, there is a list of questions on which information are taken. Uh, so that is there. But in this type of survey, there is no question. Questions are not in front of you. Also, you don't know the person who is asking you the question. Uh, sometimes, uh, maybe that someone who knows uh, you calls, uh, he or she is doing a research, so you can take information from him. That is done. But mostly, the people who call you, you don't know the person. You don't know the where the question he or she is going to ask. He, you don't know that whether the person is really reliable. He is telling that he is calling from Axis Bank, but really is he calling from Axis Bank? He is telling that the purpose of the study is to conduct a survey. Really, he will do that he is conducting a survey. If it is a direct personal interview and someone asks me that, okay, I have been in for I have research on this area, I may ask him his eye chart. That what is the authenticity that you are doing a research in this place? Where is your eye chart? What you believe? Let me show, uh, let me uh, uh, verify your identity. These type of things are not possible in a telephonic interview. So this is one aspect that the telephonic interviews are mostly difficult to complete. Some people start next. What happens that if the question is very long, because uh, talking long in a telephone is not a very good, uh, I means uh, how many people I don't know like talking long in a telephone, long hours in a telephone. Yeah, sometimes some official calls and other things or uh, we have to be there uh, this talk for a long time, but whether it is really, really enjoyable, and your wife calling or girlfriend calling, you have to uh, complete the conversation as long as it goes on. Uh, but uh, this is also uh, okay. You are conversing does not mean that you are actually conversing. You might be uh, wanting to end the conversation. I personally don't like talking long over a over telephone, but sometimes I have to because of other reasons. Anyway, so first thing is that. Second thing is that if the uh, interview means becomes long in a telephone, then it becomes very difficult uh, to conclude the interview. So most of such interviews get terminated. Also, sometimes there are um, uh, link failures and all, and the telephonic interview is not successful. Also, telephonic interview will should be very specific. Like if you are asking that out of 10, how much will you think on the, say, uh, suppose I am uh, taking an interview on the, uh, about a restaurant, that uh, how much out of 10 will you give to the ambience of the restaurant? How much out of 10 will you give on the taste of the food served in the restaurant? How much uh, out of 10 will you give on the quality of food that is served in the restaurant. So something like out of 5 or out of 10, like this, this type of statements are actually asked to the individuals. So these are over, uh, so that the answer is relatively easier. 
Sometimes uh, one day one lady called me, she is giving a lot of verbal description. She is asking a question and then telling that poor, average, uh, strongly agree, agree, good, fair, beautiful. Uh, like this, she is giving many options. Every time I was telling, please repeat the options. And once again she was reading the entire line with so many verbal descriptors. Uh, and, but uh, these verbal descriptors in a telephonic interview is not a good thing to do. So they should be simple point scale like out of 5 or out of 10. And the number of questions should be short, not necessarily more than 8 or 10. Uh, so these uh, telephonic interviews have some uh, problems definitely. Uh, personal contact is always better, so direct personal interview is something which is very much appreciated and actually is quite popular in research than other types of interviews. Uh, but it is expensive, time consuming, uh, these uh, direct personal interviews and always uh, these direct personal interviews are to be performed to trained investigators or trained enumerators, not untrained people, not just picking up someone from the uh, from the ground zero and putting the person in that. For example, uh, this question. Uh, let us go to the next slide. This we covered last time. Okay. Zero. Thank you. So, in questionnaire method, as I was telling, the list of questions are saved by post, email, or personal delivery to the respondent with a covering letter. The respondent reads the covering letter and if he is confident that okay, if he is satisfied, he will fill out the question uh, at his own sweet will. So he has the list of questions but he does not see any interviewer in front of him who may die. So in a questionnaire, the um, materials or the explanation should be clearly written. Sometimes some information in a questionnaire might be confusing. Uh, for example, I remember that uh, once uh, I was filling some information for the university uh, from the teacher about their research, publication, etc. There was one column, this was sent by some other author, other party, third party, I was collecting on their behalf. So there was a question that uh, or a column, what is the pen number? Name of the individual designation pen number. Now some people actually reacted to it. They are telling that we are providing information about our uh, research, then why shall we provide the PEN number? And I also thought that yes, this seems very unreasonable. Then we asked the uh, third party who asked us to collect the information. They told that actually PEN number will help us to identify that what is the current institute of the respondent. That means some institutes they have found that they are really providing information about some people who have retired or some people who have left the job or some people who never work with him, them at all in order to show huge number of publications and huge research activities they are hiring. But when you give the PEN number, with the help of PEN number we can trace it that whether this person is really working in that organization or really working in your organization. That is the purpose. But the thing is that no mention of such things were there in the questionnaire. And this sometimes confuses the people because they might feel that this information is unnecessarily collected and no way related to the study. For example, another interesting example I may give you that once what happened a German person, uh, a German actually accompanied me to my uh, town. I mean he met in Calcutta and then he wanted to visit the university and deliver some lectures. So I uh, brought him along with me. And I went uh, placed him in some hotel. Now when I was placing him in a hotel, the hotel person, was, uh, we uh, came early in the morning. The reception was not operational at that time. It was some like uh, some boys of the hotel this, uh, attendants who were actually being the work of the reception. So they were asking about the father's name. They had a form and in the form there was a column father's name, mother's name of the traveler of the guest. <coughs> Sorry. Now this German person, he was asking, what my father has to do with my stay over here? Because my father died 10 years back. What he has to do with my stay and in this particular hotel? I don't know that, I don't know that is the system in India. You pick up, do you know your father's name? He told me, yeah, yeah, I know what he tells. I know then you write. That is the rule over here. That's everywhere you have to write your parents' name. I don't know why. And now this information, according to him, is an irrelevant information. So whenever questionnaire is asked for irrelevant information or uh, seems to be irrelevant information, 
there should be some explanation why this information at all is required. And also some explanation if there is, are some complicated replies or mostly such replies should be closed and that, that means all possible options should be in the questionnaire itself and less number of open-ended questions. So this is one aspect of questionnaire. Uh, most in questionnaire method of data collection. One good example, a uh, good uh, advantage, a huge advantage of the questionnaire method is that a huge geographical area can be covered with the help of this questionnaire method of data collection. Earlier, if there was one disadvantage that it is uh, expensive in a sense that you have to post it so that there is a postal expense in addition to that there should be a retired post also, which is also expensive. But nowadays, these things are quickly administered over, uh, quickly administered over email, which is uh, no, not at all expensive. You can give as many number of reminders also. You can schedule some reminders that after a particular day, uh, the reminder will reach that person. So that all these things can be done, so that way it has become easier. Cover uh, and vast geographical area and also another advantage is that since investigator is not present, so some people can give better responses. For example, some sensitive questions, if someone is present asking you some questions, then you might feel that, oh, this, uh, okay, let me not answer it or give a very moderate answer. But when it is uh, no uh, investigator is in between the question and the respondent, uh, then uh, some easy, I mean, things are easily answered or quickly answered. So this is the uh, one. Investigator sometimes become biased also, sometimes his uh, facial expression, sometimes his tone actually uh, reflect uh, the biasness, which might influence the respondent. For example, if I go and ask information, in many information about which one is related to domestic violence, and if I ask the respondent, Acha, ab bibi ko marta ho? Eh? Marta ho bibi ko? So from the tone and tenor and my face, uh, facial expression, the person uh, might feel that, okay, this uh, uh, this person will not like my response if I tell that, yes, I, I beat my wife. So the respondent says, no, no, never, never. This is very unethical. This is very unhuman. Yeah, this is what, this is, this I never. He will respond like this. And we say, oh, okay, okay, investigator is happy. So this type of things are not happening in a question and method of data collection. Problem is with non-response. Problem is with non-response. In our country, you see, uh, hardly people, I mean, if you look at the huge population of India, all of you might be having two, three email addresses, but mostly you will find that people are without email addresses. How many people are using email addresses? Very few. Uh, considering the entire population of the country, it is not compulsory. So obviously, when you want to perform a survey to email, uh, you, uh, your population gets very restricted. Your population gets very restricted. And also these days, some people, because email is a very modern thing for, for them, so they are not using. And some people are not using because email is a very dedicated thing for them. For example, you see, if I tell my parents that uh, one email will come to you, they don't have an email address. So obviously, they will, exclude it, will be excluded from the study. If I tell my children that the information will come to you through email, they are very scared of email. They think it is very dedicated. They might have an email address, but they never check it. For them, this is gender and uh, WhatsApp. These are more uh, comfortable things, not an email ID. If I tell them they send a photo to me by email, uh, then they even my students, if I tell them send a photo, send the assignment to me by email, and they tell me, uh, can I send by WhatsApp? Actually, the thing is that suppose you have taken a photograph or have a PDF document in your mobile, and there is an option share. And when you put your finger on share, Different option comes out of which one, one is WhatsApp, another is Gmail. So, easier to send by same thing only, whether you send by WhatsApp or by Gmail. The amount of trouble required is same. But I don't know why they don't like Gmail. They want to send by WhatsApp or send to WhatsApp. So, some people don't uh, use the email because they feel it is dedicated. Some people are actually for them, email is too modern. So, email is somewhere in between. Very interesting, this thing. So people uh, might not and, uh, okay, now even after now, even after uh, someone is having, uh, 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 using email, might not respond. Yeah, if the information, uh, question comes from income tax department, where uh, providing information is mandatory, the person will definitely respond. But if it is for a research survey, someone may respond, someone may not respond. Like that. These days, some people are actually sending a questionnaire through Google Docs. 
in Google Doc, they are preparing the questionnaire and send it to the response. That okay, okay, you take this uh, questionnaire, fill it up. They provide a link. Now, sometimes I click the link and then I also want to help the researcher. I click the link and I find that the questionnaire is so big. And almost similar type of questions asking over and over again and then first page, second page like this unless you kill the first page you cannot go to the second page and this is a big uh, huge time killing exercise. So whenever question are there they should be uh, small in size because that has remained as a very big uh, issue related to question and thought and that is the non-response. Uh, so we actually go to the next slide then. And then another issue is with like uh, schedule method. In a schedule method, actually the respondent comes to you with a questionnaire. That is the difference between a questionnaire and a schedule. Questionnaire is sent to you by post or by email or by hand delivery. So you and the questionnaire is there. Uh, here in case of schedule, there is a person who comes with, along with the list of questionnaires. And here the questions are not that uh, straightforward or has lot of explanation. Because the person will fill it up has all the has taken proper training. So something may be in coded form, so he knows what to do, ask and what to teach it up. And the person uh, who is being uh, interviewed, that person may also see the schedule. So let me see whether this thing is there in the schedule or not. So these, here are the questions that is available. Person collecting the information, he is also available before you. And he is explaining all the things. And if you have some doubt whether really it is there in the questionnaire or is there, there in the schedule, you may check it up. So that way, it is better than a questionnaire. And also, this can be schedule method can be implemented for respondents who are illiterate. Because uh, the person can go. Sometimes, uh, generally, we see the printed questionnaire in printed schedule. But some schedules are this, this electronic. Now, electronically, they are filled up. Some device quite similar to a mobile phone where the different statements are there and they are filled, filled up and then uh, there will be a submit button after the survey is over, the respondent will submit it and accordingly this will get submitted. So this is another way of uh, using the schedule. So this is population, uh, population census in our country is actually collected using this method. Here the data will be relatively, uh, relatively reliable data compared to questionnaire method, but uh, in some sensitive questions, uh, actually, it might be difficult uh, for getting the exact information because some respondents might feel shy to discuss about some matter in the presence of the respondent, uh, in the presence of the enumerator in schedule method. But uh, a sincere and trained enumerator knows different ways, tricks and tips uh, to how to get over uh, the respondent so that they don't feel shy and they participate, so participate wholeheartedly to this uh, type of uh, service. For example, this is, for example, this is a, how many children do you have? He is asking. This. Now, this person is having many children, one, two, three, four, and another in the back. But the person is telling that I have only one child. I have only one child. These are all um, uh, not my children, like only one. Then one small, uh, this girl, uh, she is telling, Mommy, Papa, I am going Mommy, Papa, I am going So, with this uh, actually event taking place, the respondent will understand, sorry, the enumerator will understand that, okay, okay, so he is actually having five children, but uh, he is telling only one, but this is not true. So this is what the enumerator does. Uh, presence of a trained enumerator, this is the advantage that one has. Uh, the trained enumerator is not trained, he will lock down only the part the person is telling. It will take the things in the page well. So this is the difference uh, of a uh, trained and an untrained enumerator. Now here is one uh, particular technique of collecting information. This is actually a uh, non-random technique of collecting information. This is called as a snowball method of collecting information. Here actually a person giving the response will be providing information about the other person who are using this particular uh, habit or having this particular product which are rare in number or some disease may be say like cancer and all. Uh, because the person suffering from a particular problem or having a particular habit will know definitely about some other people who are also suffering from similar problem or suffering from similar types of habit. For example, you must have seen some people they smoke pipes. Generally, it is seen in films that some people smoking pipes. Because uh, pipe smoking is a little bit difficult also to put this fire into the uh, 
super uh, tobacco in the pipe. Uh, so let it up. It is quite time consuming. Everyone might not be able to do. Uh, now, uh, suppose you want to uh, conduct a survey on such issues. Now uh, you have to get hold of some person who smokes pipe. Uh, a starting point can be in your town there might be some shop who sells this type of tobacco, pipe smoking tobacco. And he may be selling other things also, but pipe smelling, um, pipe uh, smoking tobacco is available. So you go to that person and ask him that who are the customers of pipe smoking tobacco. Then he might tell you some name or if not, he may tell you to wait that someday some customer will come and ask for pipe smoking tobacco. You wait for two, three days and then you find one person who actually purchases that pipe smoking tobacco. So you contact that person, ask him the information that how do you feel, what are the brand available, why have you have not shifted to other type of smoking, is it possible to push the smoking, pipe smoking tobacco uh, like this. Uh, so you ask him whatever your survey purpose is, ask the question. And then go to another person, ask him at the end, do you know some other person who also smokes pipe? He tells that why I know many people uh, like this, this, uh, these people, that people, that one. And they smoke. So you contact, take the address from them and contact those people. So they will provide you information about some other people and then they will provide information about some other people. Uh, like a snowball which starts as a small ball at the top of the mountain and as it uh, comes down it rolls and takes a bigger pipe. Similarly what will happen with this and uh, so uh, at the end of the survey you will get a huge number of people who are actually uh, falling under that criteria which you are searching. For example, let me perform a survey that how do people feel when they are bitten by snake? Because when people are bitten by snake, they are actually uh, having issues like uh, pain or what type of issues, whether they get tense, whether they get, um, uh, whether it is a pain which was more unbearable or the situation like uh, they feel that they might die at any moment. So these are the situations. So suppose you go to the casualty department of a medical college or a civil hospital or a state government hospital because nursing homes will not entertain these cases because they know that there is nothing uh, much uh, you can do with these cases. So go to a hospital. In the hospital they have a register where they write the names, uh, phone number, address of the individuals who come to them and uh, from there you find about A. When you meet A and ask about this survey and then ask him how many people do you know who are bitten by the snake. He is quite informative. He tells about D, D and C who are also bitten by the snake. Now when you visit D, D tells about E, F and G and also tells about D also tells about G. The G already D has told so this does not add up and uh, D tells about C which information already you have collected because you have got it from A. C tells about H. H tells about S. H tells about W, but W has uh, gone to Delhi, you could not get this person. So, or you may visit that person, W told that no, that is that was a rumor, I was bitten by snake. I was actually bitten by garden lizard, not by snake. So you see, you start with one individual and at the end of the study, <coughs> sorry, uh, at some point of time you have many individuals from whom you have the information and these are all the people who are bitten by the snake and are alive, obviously, if the person died, uh, then you will not be able to collect the information about uh, his feelings when he was bitten by the snake, he or she. Uh, so this is called as a chain referral system and with the chain referral system you can get in touch with many number of people but this is actually a type of a non-random technique of getting information because here uh, the control is over A who gives you information about B, B, C and the control is on D who gave you information about E, F, G like that is good part. But when you survey a large number of people, you will find that uh, after some time, they are referring to the, those individuals from whom information was already collected. So, these are the few things that we wanted to cover under different methods of interview. So, if you have any questions, we can take the questions.